Louis Wirth was born to religious Jewish parents in 1897 in Germany. When he was 14 years old, he followed his older sister to live with an uncle in Omaha, Nebraska, so he left Germany before the disaster of the First World War. In Omaha, he grew up, finished high school, and then went on to college at the University of Chicago. He earned his bachelor's degree in 1919 and his Ph.D. in 1926. After spending three years at Tulane University, he returned to the University of Chicago for the rest of his life, where he wrote extensively about immigrant adaptation to new social settings, including his first book, The Ghetto, published in 1928, and also about how cities may affect the personal lives of their residents in this famous 1938 article in the American Journal of Sociology, a journal published at the University of Chicago. Worth died suddenly of a heart attack in 1952, still in the prime of his career. In this article, he suggests that the faster pace, larger scale, and impersonal nature of city life have a corrosive effect on personal social bonds and can even produce harmful psychological effects for urban residents. The influence of this idea of the city as psychologically dangerous has spread far and wide, and this article possibly has become the single most cited reference in the history of American urban sociology. This urbanism as a way of life article often has been described as a translation into English of the ideas of the German scholar Georg Simmel. Simmel's 1903 essay, Die Großstadt und das Geistesleben, translated as Metropolis and Mental Life, put forward nearly all the ideas found in Wirth's article while Wirth himself was still a small boy living in Germany. Wirth quotes from Simmel's work in his own article. His announced goal is to, quote, select those elements of urbanism which mark it as a distinctive mode of human group life, unquote. With this aim, Wirth stakes out the city as a subject for separate sociological study, distinct from the study of social forms such as family and kinship, religion, productive economic activities, or perhaps warfare and other forms of violence. Cities are worthy of study in their own right and courses about them, according to this perspective, because the way people relate to each other and the social connections they make take on new forms in cities that do not happen outside of them and that did not happen in the past before cities arose. He begins by contrasting life in cities with what he calls a rural or folk society. He and several of his colleagues at the University of Chicago shared this image of folk society as they imagined it would appear in a Neolithic village or other context outside urban life. According to this image, people all are able to know each other personally, face to face, and live in close contact as a group pretty much all of their lives. Because they all experience the same environment, challenges, and opportunities, and because of their long-term personal interactions, these people share the same hopes, fears, beliefs, and attitudes about right and wrong ways to go about the business of life. They form a cohesive community, a bubble of culture that completely envelops them and provides a stable, shared set of goals and even rules for everyday life. Saying that they speak the same language in this case would go far beyond just the actual words they speak. Once he bought into this image of pre-urban or non-urban social consensus, stability, and tight-knit social control, the defining difference to be found in city life rested above all on everything that was the opposite of the supposed solidarity of the folk community. His famous three characteristics of the urban social context appear in the work of many, if not most, of the urban scholars who have come after him. As he sums it up in the abstract to this 1938 article, quote, A city is a relatively large, dense, and permanent settlement of heterogeneous individuals, unquote. The first of these three distinctive features of city life is simply its scale or size, based on the number of people living together and coming into contact with each other on a regular basis. He criticizes various specific boundary lines used to measure whether a place is big enough to count as urban. The U.S. Census rule that counts any place with less than 2,500 people as rural and any place with 2,500 or more as urban comes in for special criticism. Still, Worth acknowledges that some consideration of sheer numbers is essential to his definition. 
These must be crowded together to some degree, producing density of settlement. It expresses reservations about particular dividing lines, such as a thousand people per square mile, but obviously one can't just zoom out over the countryside and count up scattered farms and villages until you reach the total for an urban area, and then claim that all those people are urban based only on numbers. It has to be a matter of numbers of people per some unit measure of area, whatever the actual specific figure might be. Finally, he insists that a mass of people living crowded into a limited area still does not give rise to what he means by urban society, unless they also differ from one another in important ways. Partly, as he says, these differences may be caused, or at least encouraged, by the size and density of settlement themselves, since this makes it easier for people to specialize in certain activities. These are none other than the full-time, skilled, non-agricultural specialists that appear in the definitions of urban life used by virtually all of the scholars who came after Worth and who wrote about the urban revolution and the emergence of cities from the pre-urban Neolithic world. This is no coincidence, because this article by Worth served as one of the key foundation stones for the work of all these other scholars. They were all following his lead and adopting the concepts put forward by this Chicago school of sociologists. But a careful reading of Worth's article makes it clear that none of these three crucial features of a distinctive urban social context are themselves sociological in the sense that he seeks for his theory meaning that they somehow measure a special, distinctive form of human group life that deserves the label urban as opposed to rural or folk life. Size, density, and heterogeneity are for worth more like three pieces of firewood that he piles together, the raw material out of which an urban way of life is born. This is the heart of the meaning of his title, Urbanism as a Way of Life. By choosing this conceptual approach, Worth, Worth concentrates not on the city as a physical environment at all, but on the city as a state of mind, just as Zimmel had done in Germany a generation earlier. A question from this angle, looking for a distinctive pattern of ideas and social interactions that is caused by urban living. And if we combine it with the other popular image from the Chicago School of a stable, harmonious, close-knit community of people united by ties of kinship, language, religion, and custom into a folk society, we have all the ingredients we need to construct Worth's entire theory of urbanism as a way of life. His colleagues at Chicago drew a lot of their inspiration for connecting urban context with personal psychological outcomes from the earlier work of Charles Horton Cooley at the neighboring University of Michigan. Cooley's theory of human personality built up chiefly by introspection and by observing his own children, stressed the idea that in everything we do, we are guided by a picture of the world we have constructed for ourselves out of our daily experience. Later generations of psychologists refer to this guiding picture as a cognitive map. The personal map emerged from what he called primary interactions as part of life in what he called a primary group. Not surprisingly, given his own life, the archetype example of a primary group is the small nuclear family of mother, father, and their children. Years of intimate life together shape not only this cognitive map, but the entire personality of people, whether they become trusting or suspicious, aggressive or passive, calm or nervous, and so on. This theory of personality as a byproduct of primary group interaction has been criticized, for example, by Dennis Wrong in a famous article called The Over-Socialized View of Man in Sociology. But Cooley's ideas about primary ties as essential determinants of personality are embedded deep at the heart of Lewis Worth's theory of urbanism as a way of life. Without this kernel of an idea, the rest of Worth's conclusions would not work out as he imagines them. For example, consider how Worth connects sheer numbers of people to various outcomes for personal life. He says, quote, The increase in numbers involves a changed character of the social relationships, unquote. Citing both Zimmel and Max Weber from Germany, Worth makes the argument that you can only maintain close relationships with a limited number of people. In fact, that limit defines the size of primary groups as Cooley described them earlier. A nice lady once presented me with a homespun example of this idea, along with a wonderful piece of homemade apple pie, 
when I made my usual stop at an isolated high-desert gas station restaurant combination along the highway between my eastern Oregon home and the college I was attending in Portland. I described life in Portland to her in response to her questions. She observed that it sounded like in the city there were plenty of people but a shortage of trees, so people cared a lot about trees. In contrast, out in her empty territory east of the mountains, there were plenty of trees, but a shortage of people. And so, she suggested, people cared more about other people and less about trees. She had no idea that she was channeling Lewis Worth and countless scholars who followed his conceptual lead. Stanley Milgram, famous for his shocking experiments about the willingness of people to follow orders, even if it means hurting other people, also dabbled in this same pool where the social environment influences our personal relationships. As he put it, the sheer number of people you encounter in the course of a day in the city makes it impossible for you to even attempt to maintain primary ties with most of them. He called this overwhelming pressure of numbers sensory overload and suggested that it has a kind of numbing effect on our attitude toward other people. We have to learn to treat most other people as strangers, almost as so much furniture or landscape, in order to cope with the press of numbers in everyday life. He too was echoing Lewis Worth's description of, quote, the multiplication of persons in a state of interaction under conditions which make their contact as full personalities impossible, unquote. Of course, Worth does not suggest that city people have no contacts with others. What changes is the nature of these contacts, shifting from primary ties to what he calls secondary contacts, which are, as he puts it, quote, impersonal, superficial, transitory, and segmental, unquote. When he says segmental, he means that only a small part of the other person's life plays any part in the interaction. A familiar example of a secondary contact would be your interaction with the checkout clerk in the grocery store. You don't know or care about that person's private life, and they don't know or care about yours. Your contact is impersonal, superficial, short-lived, and limited only to exchanging groceries for money. You never think twice about each other after that moment. In this way, Lewis Worth explains the origin of a state of mind and existence that French sociologist Emile Durkheim called anomie, summing it up as the effect of urban life. Quote, the individual gains, on the one hand, a certain degree of emancipation or freedom from the personal and emotional controls of intimate groups. He loses, on the other hand, the spontaneous self-expression, the morale, and the sense of participation that comes with living in an integrated society." Unquote. It is important to remember that this connection Worth makes between size, density, and heterogeneity of urban populations, on one hand, and the eclipse of primary ties and relationships by secondary contacts on the other depends on some key assumptions for its larger theoretical impact. In order to go on, as Worth does, and say that this trend causes serious problems for the important process of personality formation, he must also build in Cooley's idea that such personality formation depends on a certain kind of intimate social environment, such as a close-knit family group. The combination of all these ideas and the resulting conclusion that mental health is threatened by urban living has spread widely throughout the scholarly world of psychologists, sociologists, and others, though it has not yet made much of an impact on economists, whose entire theoretical frame of reference is pretty much limited to Worth's urban way of living and thinking as independent individuals. So it is not much of an exaggeration to suggest that this little article by Lewis Worth forms one of the cornerstones of a very widespread, influential way of looking at how the social context of daily life shapes the ideas and even personalities of the people living within that context. In particular, if you're willing to accept his starting assumptions about human nature and personality, he makes a strong case that the basic facts of cities as a distinctive kind of social environment must inevitably cause a distinctive urban way of life for individuals who live in them. Moves on from the effect of sheer numbers of people to the question of density of settlement, on his page 14, Worth begins to draw out the implications of the urban context for larger social institutions and patterns. Drawing on Durkheim again, as well as on Darwin's observations about plants and animals, 
He suggests that packing a lot of people together into a city, either pre-industrial or modern, quote, tends to produce differentiation and specialization, since only in this way can the area support increased numbers, unquote. All this specialization affects the occupations of individuals and the connections between occupational groups. Policemen put on uniforms, and everybody knows they're policemen, and most people don't know anything else about them except that they are policemen. Some people become teachers, some people become lawyers, or bank clerks, or taxi drivers, or professional politicians, or professional football players, or electricians, or dancing instructors. When all these people meet on the streets of the city in their cars, all strangers to each other, they depend on traffic lights to get through the intersections to where they need to be. They depend on distant farms and corporate grocery stores for a food supply, and on public utilities for their water and the lights in their offices and homes, just as other people depend on each of them to provide their own specialized services that keep the society in existence. This is not anything like a folk community any longer. In many ways, all of its operating principles are the exact opposite of that folk community. Or perhaps, as some critics have suggested, the whole idea of the folk community is more likely just the exact opposite of the social world more familiar to these social theorists, who after all formed their theories in an urban setting already familiar to them. Worth ranges widely over the social landscape as he spins out many other examples of how numbers, density, and heterogeneity which is itself produced by size and density, apparently, have an effect on urbanism as a way of life. Several of these brief comments have become, in the hands of later scholars influenced by him, the basis for entire books or even schools of thought in the social sciences. For example, on the bottom of page 14 and the top of page 15, he talks about specialization as it affects land use and the physical shape of the city itself. Quote, we are exposed to glaring contrasts between splendor and squalor, between riches and poverty. The competition for space is great, so that each area generally tends to be put to the use which yields the greatest economic return. Place of work tends to become dissociated from place of residence, for the proximity of industrial and commercial establishments makes an area both economically and socially undesirable for residential purposes." Unquote. In this short passage, Worth lays the foundation assumptions about market forces and land use that eventually bloomed into the entire tradition of urban ecology, including the bullseye sectors of Burgess and the pie wedge zones of Hoyt, as well as playing a key role in the eventual rise of urban political economy as a reaction to the urban ecology tradition. A little further on, he observes that, quote, persons of homogeneous status and needs unwittingly drift into, consciously select, or are forced by circumstances into the same area. The city consequently tends to resemble a mosaic of social worlds in which the transition from one to the other is abrupt." Unquote. These lines prefigure a whole literature about ethnic as well as economic segregation, and also point the way toward a theory of subcultural innovation proposed by Claude Fisher nearly 40 years later, as we will see next week. Near the end of the article, Worth even refers to the largest macro-level scale of social organization and control, where political power is exercised and decisions are made that govern the shape and future of cities and society. He is not optimistic about this aspect of urbanism as a way of life. Quote, the masses of men in the city are subject to manipulation by symbols and stereotypes managed by individuals working from afar or operating invisibly behind the scenes through their control of the instruments of communication. Self-government, either in the economic, the political, or the cultural realm, is under these circumstances reduced to a mere figure of speech, or at best is subject to the unstable equilibrium of pressure groups." Unquote. When we arrive at the work of William Kornhauser on mass society as the last reading for this week, the influence of this brief passage in Worth's article should be obvious to any reader. He is equally unhappy about the long-term effect of urbanism as a way of life on individuals, as well as on larger institutions and political life. Quote, Personal disorganization, 
mental breakdown, suicide, delinquency, crime, corruption, and disorder might be expected under these circumstances to be more prevalent in the urban than in the rural community. This has been confirmed insofar as comparable indices are available, but the mechanisms underlying these phenomena require further analysis." Unquote. Lewis Worth paints a pretty bleak picture of urbanism as a way of life. We get the distinct impression that he has had just about enough of living in an early 20th century Chicago crowded with industry and immigrants and extremes of wealth and poverty, and that he may be pining away for his early years in Nebraska or even his childhood back in Germany. His pessimistic assessment of the inevitable effect of urban size, density, and heterogeneity on the personal lives of city residents and on the nature of their connections to one another colored the thinking of a sizable majority of all the urban scholars that came after him in the following century of social research. This is not to say, however, that the verdict of his colleagues was unanimous, or that everyone accepted this picture of the nature of urban life. 